Uh, ladies and gentlemen, within the past few weeks, the European Central Bank, some important executives, including Lagarde, came out and issued some statements saying, we don't like where these sovereign bond yields are going, and they're not going to be going that direction. We can assure you of that. So it was sort of a de facto yield curve control statement. Don't think about it, market. That's what they were saying. And Jeff Snyder, head of global research for Alhambra Partners, in a recent article, you wrote an essay for Real Clear Markets that's called There's Precedent for Yellen Demanding a Central Bank Rescue. And you posted that on the 5th of March. You take us back to an example of when something like this happened in the United States, when the Treasury Department said, We've got bills to pay, a lot of them. We're taking on a lot of debt. We're, we're, we've got a new deal. And these yields are rising, and we don't like that. So you, Central Bank, do something about that. Jeff, uh, tell us the story. Where do we begin? Yeah, the, the yields are rising. The, the, fe the federal government was borrowing enormously to try to stimulate the economy out of an enormous contraction. And the recovery was, was taking place, at least they thought it was taking place and starting to gain speed, and they wanted to keep it going. And the last thing anybody wanted was to have problems in interest rates. They didn't want interest rates to rise to spoil the fund before it got going too far, before it got going far enough to lead into a full and sustainable recovery, which should sound really familiar to yeah. people right now. I don't know. But this what, is not, we're not talking, talking about, about. Yeah, are you talking about today? Because the, the some employment data came out that was supposed to be super, really, really good. And the treasury uh, bonds sold off again. So this sounds like you're talking about today. Right, rising yields, inflation, recovery, massive spending, don't want to spoil the part, the Fed monetizing the debt, all this stuff. But it, it's not 2021, it was 1937. In 1937, in March 1937, all of a sudden, seeming not quite out of nowhere because they, they kind of knew it was coming, but you saw T-bill yields rise rapidly from you know be, between 15 and 20 basis points up to as high as almost 60 in a matter of a couple months. And that spilled over into long-term treasury rates too, where in a couple of weeks, the 10 year, or not the 10 year, but what they had is a long-term benchmark yield back then, rose from around 240 or so up until up into 280, almost 290. So you had a spike in yields that had Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau on the phone with Federal Reserve Chairman Mariner Eccles saying, look, pal, we need you to buy some bonds and cap these yields before they go too far. I'm going to read a, read a quote here. It was not apparently well received as Morgenthau and his staff immediately withdrew and returned later to demand, my word, your word, a, a more concrete proposal about what the Fed was going to do to counteract the firming of long-term interest rates, which he, Morgenthau, felt was attributable solely to Federal Reserve action. Um, what action? Well, first of all, the, the meeting that I was refer, referring to there was after Morgenthau called Eccles, he said, look, you guys are coming over here on a Saturday, and we're <laughs> going to have a powwow about this market stuff and treasury yields rising, which we don't want, and you're going to tell me what you're going to do about it. And Federal Reserve staff came over there, senior staff, and said, well, we'll buy a couple bonds, we'll do some limited bond buying, in which as, as the, uh, the transcript of the, or the, uh, the minutes of the meeting describe, they left the room for a couple of minutes and came back with probably not, not very happy looks on their faces and said, no, that's not good enough. We want to know what the hell you're going to do about these rising yields. And yes, they did. They blamed, they said, look, this is your fault. Because in late night, in the middle of 1936, the Federal Reserve, along with pretty much everyone, started to get really worried, not about the economy and recovery stumbling, but rather because it was looking inflationary. Like, you know, we've had rapid monetary growth, or what we call rapid monetary growth over the last couple of years since the bottom. We see wholesale prices rising often rapidly. The economy seems, people are going back to our unemployment rates, dropping all of these positive things. And really when we step back, step back and look at what we've done to get this economy moving from the trough of the Great Depression, which is an enormously huge contraction, we created a hell of a lot of money at least in the form of bank reserves. The level of bank reserves had nearly tripled from the bottom in 1932-33. The Fed's balance sheet had expanded. I think it was almost double its size. 
and we'll these go are through the numbers. Yeah. Uh, okay. Th these are unprecedented. If you want to run through the numbers, I think it's worthwhile. I want to. I yeah. Want go to. ahead. Okay. Okay. Let me flip the page here. Okay. Let's see here. So. Going back to the start of 1930, at the outset of the Great Collapse, the banking system claimed 25.1 billion in loans. Oh, before that, go go to the uh, the level of the balance sheet expansion. Okay, in 1932, total assets of nope. 6.1 billion. Is that the right one, or do I have that wrong? No, go back further. Uh, if we look Here, at, I'll dance. You find it. I'll read. Okay. I'm going to read some more right, so terrible sentences. In 1933, okay. the Federal Reserve had about 640 million in uh, government bonds on its balance sheet. That's because th those are earning assets for the Fed. The Fed needs bonds, otherwise, you know, it'll cost the Treasury to operate its system. Um, in just eight months, those first eight months of 1933, or the first eight months of that that period, they expanded the government bonds on their balance sheet from 640 million to 1.4 billion. And that, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but back then these were enormous quantities. And then in the middle of 1934, they did it again, sort of a, Q, a QE2 during the Great Depression, where they really increased the volume of government securities in their stock to 2 billion by March, March 1935. And then there was a QE3 in October of 35, which raised another 450 million. So they added about $1.7 billion in, in um, government bonds to their asset side, which offsetting that on the liability side, they increased the level of bank reserves in banks deposit accounts by 1.7 billion. But the vast majority of the monetary growth during that period was from gold flows, because remember FDR devalued the dollar, which invited, do which invited uh, private holdings of gold to flow into the United States. So in 1932, the Federal Reserve said, look, we've got 3.3 billion, billion in our own reserves, which include mostly gold, in total assets of 6.1 billion. So the Federal Reserve's balance sheet was 6.1 billion in 32. By 1937, they had 9 billion in reserves, most of which was gold, while total assets had grown to more than 13 billions. So they had, you know, they had more than doubled the size of their balance sheet, which is, you know, sort of like what the Federal Reserve has done over the last dozen years. And that was their focus, right? They were looking at what happened in their balance sheet and they thought that compared along with what we're seeing in the economy suggests an inflationary fire yeah, can't look, we, be too we far away. The level of bank reserves that banks have, it went from two and a half billion to around seven and a half billion. And so we're looking, I mean, that's, if you're a Federal Reserve guy, you're thinking that's massive monetary expansion. And now we're seeing things start to recover so we, instead of worrying about 1932 again, in, in 1936, we're going to start worrying about 1940, looking like out of control under fire inflation. And so they decided as early as 1935, they raised the prospect of, hey, we might need to do something because we've, we've created too much money. There's too much money. There's too much federal government activity. The feds are going in overdrive. The New Deal 2.0 is coming, you know, 1936 election and forward. The Roosevelt won his second term and promised to do even more. It was looking like, you know, there was no way we could possibly avoid an inflationary uh, situation unless we do something right away, which they decided in 36. They were going to raise the reserve requirement because if we've got seven and a half billion in reserves, rather than allow banks to ever use them, we'll lock up a bunch of them so that they can't. And that will that will uh, cut off this inflation here. It will nip this inflation in the bud before it ever becomes a problem. And now we're getting to the numbers that I jumped to earlier on, which I think are the most exciting numbers here, which is the, I think the theme of Eurodollar University is that, yes, here's the central bank. They're doing crazy things, but here all around is the private banking system and it's doing something completely different. And why doesn't the central bank ever look at what's happening? And those two things are related, space? right? Because everything else is, is under disarray. Everything else is in disarray and not working. That's why the central bank is doing crazy things. It's not because they're printing money. It's they're reacting to the same thing and saying, we need to do something. And so I think these, all these things actually do fit together really well. Jeff, quick question. Philosophically, why was the central bank wanting to be ahead of any inflationary pressure? Were they just scared that it would go from 1%, 2%, 8%, 16%, 32%?
I guess maybe Germany just a few, a decade ago, I guess maybe that's what they were worried about. But even today, right now, we, it's in the news, it's in our financial media. There's a lot of talk about President Biden's stimulus and how large it'll be, and maybe it'll be inflationary. Why don't we hold back a little bit? Why, why the urge to step in now before seeing the actual results? Is inflation gonna run away? I, no, the central banks have an inherent inflationary bias. And any deflationary bias didn't come about until the 60s. Remember, back in, during the Great Depression, they really didn't know what caused it. And at the time, they didn't think there was really a monetary component to it. And hmm. so it's, in terms of monetary policy, it's always looking at inflation. And again, as you just pointed out, the German experience in the early 20s, the Weimar experience with hyperinflation, that was fresh in everyone's mind especially for monetary policymakers were thinking, that's our job. Our job is to keep inflation away. This, this contraction depression stuff, maybe that's not us. We don't really know. And so in the middle of the 1930s, they weren't thinking we're gonna cause more deflation. They thought our job is to prevent inflation. And we're starting to see the buildup in inflationary pressures because we don't really know our job that well. We don't really know what it is we do. Yeah. but. But okay, you're seeing a buildup in inflationary pressures, but not assuming inflation. There's, why? Right, why the assumption? Why? That's my question. Does inflation run away? Is it unstoppable? Or why not wait to see it taking place, then step in? The idea is that you have to be ahead of the curve because if, if you if you wait until you actually see the inflationary pressures become obvious, it's too late. Too late. And that's always been the, right. the even now, that's, that's always been the operative uh, assumption for monetary policy is that, especially in this era of expectations policy, you have to lead. You can't wait to see the inflation because by the time you see it, it's too late. And that's been, it's been a, a part of the central bank ethos for a very, 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 very long time. How about we come up with a new policy? If you're in a depression, you wait to see it. You see the whites of their eyes. And then well, that's if kind of average inflation target, right? That's the Fed is starting to say, look, you know, oh. we're, we don't admit we're in a depression. We admit we're in an inflation shortfall. And to try to get out of it, we're saying we're going to not we're not going to react until we actually see it. We need to react. That's really what average inflation targeting is, is the Fed is trying to make sense of these two. What it used to think are a contradictory situation, but it really is consistent. The Fed doesn't do money doesn't understand its job, and that's why we have an inflation shortfall, and thus produces this latest turn, which is, oh, we have to see inflation before we actually do anything. But that was certainly not what they were thinking in 1936 and 37. They became more and more convinced that inflation was absolutely certain to happen, and we better do something big before it does. Because and as you're about to get to with the numbers, yeah. they had all the information in front of them that said, nah, you guys are you're tilting at windmills here. That's the point you make. You're saying this data that we're about to, to bring up was available to them. Well, but... it comes from the Federal Reserve. This is Federal Reserve compiled data. Okay, so this is the punchline of the, the article. So going back to the start of 1930, at the outset of the Great Collapse, the banking system, which Jeff and I feel is the primary creator of money, claimed $25.1 billion in loans, of which 4.1 billion was various government obligations. No, in addition, 4.1. So it was 25 billion in loans, as well as 4 billion in uh, government obligations. Very well, okay. Then, at the bottom, in March 1933, banks reported just 12.9 billion in loans, but interestingly enough, an increase in government securities to 6.9. So they went from 25.1 to loans to 12.9, but government obligations from 4.1 to 6.9. Now here we are in March, 1937. They claimed 13.7 billion in loans. And again, this is the banking system. So 13.7, with 12.7 in various treasuries. Do I have all that right? Yep, so loans essentially collapsed by half, which was the great contraction, the devastating deflationary consequences of the Great Depression. 
And then afterward, during what was supposed to be a recovery, there was barely any recovery in lending at all, mm. while the banking system was only too happy to buy up whatever the government was selling, which again should sound very familiar. <laughs> well, why were they, we talked about this, I suppose, and you bring up a great example here of a, of a quote. Let me read this quote here, and it explains why they were buying government securities. They were also buying not just government securities, in this quote, in discussing the motion, Governor Norris pointed out that while action was not necessary, it was highly desirable as the excess reserves constituted a source of danger. And as an example, he indicated that even now there was some evidence of inflationary results from the excess reserves, especially in the bond market, where a two and three quarters bond of a rural county seat could be sold at a premium, meaning you know, junk bonds were being bought at a premium. Why were government securities and junk bonds being bought at a premium? Why did, why did the because banking they system were, want simple, this? The simple fact that they were bonds, they were saleable. They had a liquid marketplace. And that's really, you know, the, the interest rate fallacy personified, especially in Governor Norris's case, where he misunderstood the signal the market was telling him. The market was saying, look, we're so fearful of another liquidity event, we'll buy even junk bonds because it's a bond. It's not a loan. A loan is illiquid. You can't sell it. You, you can only call them in and hope that whoever you've lent money to repays you in, in, in a sufficient quantity that you can stay afloat. Whereas a government bond or a municipal bond or even a junk corporate bond has a liquid marketplace where maybe you don't get 100 cents on the dollar if you're forced to sell, but you at least can sell the thing. So the banking system was telling the Fed, we don't want to lend. We refuse to lend. In fact, we only want the high, high, highly liquid instruments, which led to market interest rates falling and falling and falling and falling, going lower, which they misinterpreted as stimulus, inflation, positive, positive things, when we know full well that it was exactly the opposite. It was deflationary circumstances, which under, 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 undercut any inflationary probability. And had they understood just that raw data, I mean, not even granular data, but just that high level raw data from the banking system and what the banks were telling them. And there's more detail to that too if we get into the correspondence system and the way money flows throughout, this, throughout the, uh, the, uh, the banking system to begin with. There was all sorts of warning signs where the banks were telling them, look, things are not right here. Things are not going well here. And so, you know, the idea that they needed to get ahead of an inflationary curve, they were, they were tilting at windmills. They were, they're fighting inflation pressures that just didn't exist. But from the perspective of the central bank that looks at an inflationary bias and says, we just printed a bunch of money, therefore, it must be inflationary because the level of bank reserves have expanded so massively, you know, you could understand why they would make that mistake, even though you shouldn't have any sympathy for them making their mistake, because that's their job. Their job is to understand these things and make wise choices, not to just focus on the number of bank reserves and interpret, interpret ghosts of things that aren't possible. That's, I was going to read something similar to what you just said. I thought it was very, very well put. The over-infatuation with bank reserves during the 1930s was itself a consequence of bureaucrats knowing only their numbers rather than the complete extent of their jobs. Jeff, it sounds like not 1930, but 2021. Banks are saying there's a problem. We're seeing it. We're hearing it from every angle. Um, but we'll see if the bureaucrats will get it right this time. Jeff, is there anything that we didn't cover in this article that you wanted to uh, bring up? The only thing is that, look, you know, when, when Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz wrote their monetary history in 1963, which provided these monetary links to the Great Depression, among the things they cited was the fact that, again, central bankers didn't know their jobs. In fact, they even said that monetary scholarship had reached a low point in the period of the 1920s that we shouldn't have even expected central bankers to know a damn thing about money to begin with. You know, what I would say is that, look, Ever since Milton Friedman wrote those words with Anna Schwartz in 63, we've repeated it, especially from the 1980s forward. Economics and, and central bankers have let monetary scholarship just drop by the wayside in favor of positive economics and econometrics, which doesn't even include a monetary financial component in most DSG models to begin with. And so here we have, before we even get to 2008, the same kind of situation where central bankers pretend they know what they're doing, but they really don't. 
And so ever since we, the, the immediate consequences of that was in 2007, 2008, as well as the aftermath where we get, again, this idea that the economy's recovery may be even inflationary during these reflationary periods because of the level of bank reserves, but it never turns out that way because the level of bank reserves are not the complete story, nor would I think, nor do I believe them an important part of it to begin with. If only we had a scholar, a monetary scholar, who had reviewed all this and had promised to Mr. Friedman and Mrs. Schwartz that they weren't going to let this happen again, not on their watch. Oh, well, I guess that's, that didn't happen. All right, Jeff. Well, I, I guess I've taken too many pot shots at Mr. Bernanke, and I should sign off before we go even further down that rabbit hole. I had a great time. Let's do it again next week. Okay. Take care, Emil.